County, he's an historian and a photographer by trade. He's going to talk to us today about the history of photography, um, the emphasis on the Civil War era, and how important that was at that time, just beginning. I also wanted to mention, as long as I have you all captive, a couple things. This is our calendar of events. I'm going to pass it around. You can grab one if you'd like. If not, just pass it along. <laughs> okay, so welcome, Glenn. Well, thank you everyone for coming out today. And if you'd want, I'd appreciate if you'd give uh, Destiny a big round of applause. She did a lot of work to put this together, and I wasn't helping much, just sending emails every now and then, but she did a lot of, of uh, promoting of the event and everything. Um, my name is Glenn. We do uh, Step Back Studio, which is vintage style portraits. And some of those look like these here. What we do is dress people up. These folks were actually in period dress already. So we just do uh, a photograph and a portrait and try and make it look like it's from that period. Some of you may know this gentleman. It's Fritz Klein, actually, <laughs> from, uh, from uh, Springfield. And here was an attempt with metallic paper to just give it that old vintage style look, almost a tin type kind of look. So that's what we do with Step Back Studio. It started out as a hobby, like all hobbies do. They kind of get away on themselves. Uh, it always paid for itself, which was nice for a hobby. But it turned into a business, as hobbies also do that as well. Uh, I've got kind of a trick question. We're going to talk about the history of photography first. And I don't like trick questions, but just raise your hand and shout out a year. What year do you think photography started? 1839. 1839. Anybody else? Just take a guess. 1841. 1841. Any others? 1842. 1852. Okay, these are all good dates. The trick part of it is, and I hate trick questions, is it didn't happen in any one year. There were a lot of problems that had to be solved, a lot of uh, inventions, a lot of ideas had to happen. Uh, the one thing that makes photography work is light. So if you want to be real technical, whenever that started, it's kind of when photography could have started. We're going to go back over 500 years, though, during the 1500s when they realized this. If you had a dark room, and there was a small hole in the wall or a crack in the shutter that was covering the window, mm -hmm. the scene from the outside would get projected onto that opposite wall. But it would be inverted. It would be upside down and backwards. If there was a sign on this building, all the letters would appear reversed or backwards. This was called a camera obscura. The words camera obscura translate into dark room. Leonardo da Vinci had written about this phenomenon in his notebooks as well. So it's kind of magic, but it's real simple. You can do this in your own homes. If we could block off these windows and use a big piece of cardboard or maybe one of those real black garbage bags and make a hole about this big and put it in there, the scene from the outside would get projected in. You may have to take a piece of paper and hold it up to that hole and then slide it back or forth and find out where the focus is. It all kind of depends on how big that hole is. But you can make your own camera obscura at home. Again, it's a real simple thing, but it's still it's kind of magic when you do see it. All about the mid-1500s, an Italian scientist said, what if we put a lens right where that hole is? So he put a convex lens right there. It's the kind that are fat on both sides. Well, that made the image a lot brighter and a lot clearer. They could see it a lot better. Well, now they started to see that where they could use it as a tool. Up until that point, if you wanted a reproduction of what you're looking at, the camera, the fireplace, the wall, you'd have to bring in an artist, and they would make that reproduction for you. So your reproduction was only as good as the talent of that artist. But with this camera obscura, they saw they could use that as a tool. They could lay the paper on that projected image and trace it, and they could get it a lot closer. 
Well, it was hard to drag around a house that had a hole in the shutter, so they made portable camera obscuras. Some of them were set up like this, like a tripod or like a uh, pyramid. They'd have canvas around those poles. The lens was up in the top here, and a mirror would reflect the image and project it down below. Well, then the artist would be down in, that, in the darkness there tracing that image that got projected. Well, they carried these around during the early parts of the, the 1600s, and these worked pretty good. I made one of these, and the hardest thing is to get the world to stand still for you. <laughs> Trees are always moving. Buildings are okay. Even people are breathing and moving. Uh, but it was a tool that they used, especially for buildings, to so just get it a little closer to the reality. Well, about the, uh, shortly after those in the early 1600s, a German scientist came up with the idea of taking two boxes. One was a little smaller than the other one, so it would slide inside of it. And he put his lens on one box and a piece of brown glass, or like a frosted glass, on the other. And if you can see through the window, it just projects through. Well, on that glass, he could lay his paper and do his drawings then which was a little nicer. He could be out in the open. He didn't have to be in the darkness of that uh, pyramid idea. So that was working real good. About another 50 years go by, another German scientist said, what if we put a mirror inside the boxes? Reflect the image up. He could lay his paper right on the top there, and it made it a lot easier to do his drawings. So by now we're up to the 1700s, we got a single lens reflecting camera, an SLR. We're still using the same idea today, it works. It's that simple and it, it still works. So we're up to the 1700s, they have a camera, now all they need is some chemistry. Well, something that a chemist knew in the 1700s were that some compounds of silver would get dark if they were exposed to light. So they were experimenting with silver salts, silver nitrates, putting it on all kinds of surfaces like paper, cloth, leather, wood, and they were putting these things in their cameras and they were getting really good images. But as they looked at it, the light was hitting it and it would all turn black. That's what held up photography for quite a few years, how to make it not light sensitive once you had that image. So that held it up for quite a few years. In 1838, a Frenchman with the last name Daguerreau, uh, he announced, I have captured reality in its most minute detail. And he did a pretty good job of it. It was on a smaller piece of polished silver. Uh, it was a very dangerous process. He'd heat up mercury, and the mercury vapors would uh, react with his light-sensitive material. Uh, it was that camera obscura again, so the images were reversed. If you had uh, letters on your belt buckle or something like that, they'd all be reversed. It'd be just the opposite. If you wanted another image, you had to go through the entire process again to get it. There was no way to make a duplicate. Well, shortly after Daguerreau's announcement, an Englishman but with the uh, last name of Talbot came up with this paper idea. He was able to stop it from being light sensitive. But then he took it a step further. He took another piece of light sensitive paper, put that first one on it, and then shone it to light. The light would shine through the fibers of the paper, and then he would come up with his positive, coined the phrase negative and then positive. Well, this was great. He could make as many as he wanted. They were all identical. Plus, a week later, he could make another one. Boom, it was still the same. Well, this idea was real good. It was a lot safer process. The only thing was the fibers of the paper. That minute detail that Daguerreau was achieving was lost with the fibers of the paper. In a Daguerreau-type, you can see the stitching on their clothes and the individual whiskers on their face. It was very clear and, and high resolution. Well, another Englishman uh, by the name of Archer said, well, let's... Let's not use paper, let's use glass. Glass doesn't have any fibers, it's clear. This isn't glass, it's just a piece of sheet film. So he put his light sensitive material on the glass, put it in the camera, and it all ran off. It all just slid off. The glass was too shiny or too smooth. 
So he mixed up what they call a collodion. Uh, the word collodion translates to stick. Well, they pour that on there first and get an even coating of it, pour off the excess, and while it was still wet and tacky, if, if you've ever spilled a little syrup on the table at breakfast and you missed it and you found it that evening with your elbow, it's a little tacky and sticky, well, then it would hold the silver nitrates, so they could dip it in that and it would hold that to the glass. That's how it got called wet plate photography, because it had to stay a little wet or sticky. They put them in a film holder that was similar to this. They're notched all along the edges, so when you close the dark slide, no light can get in there. Well, they would have to do that part of it. The collodion they could do in the light, but then dipping it into the light-sensitive material, they'd have to do in complete darkness. And that they would set up and get ready before they were ready to do the exposure. Now, on the exposure, again, they would move that lens forward or back, and that would give them a focus at subjects at different distances, depending where they put the lens. They would focus on that piece of glass in the back, and then they would close, put the uh, lens cap on. Once they had their focus, they pushed this out of the way, and now that plane or that area that they focused on, they replaced with their light sensitive glass now. So you lift the dark slide and you're ready to make the exposure. Now all our uh, cameras nowadays have shutters. Theirs were just big open lenses like this one. So the only way they had to control that exposure was their lens cap. A day like today, it's not very sunny out. So an exposure would take a lot longer than if it were a bright sunlight out. And then uh, to, to try and get a standard unit or measurement of time, they would sing a song to themselves or recite a poem or sing a nursery rhyme or sing it twice. And that just helped them kind of get a standard uh, unit of time. I'm going to put this lens back on because we'll have you look through the camera. It's a little easier to see. Any questions so far? I'm going kind of fast. So once they've exposed that to light, they put that lens cap back on, close the dark slide, and again they'd have to finish processing that while it was still wet or tacky. And that's again how it got called wet plate photography. Uh, photography was like any skilled trade. It was something that you had to learn, so you would be an apprentice for someone that was already running a studio. Come on in. So, you'd be, <laughs> so you, would, uh, you would be an apprentice for a, a person that had a studio going already, and that means you would do all the work. But by doing all the work, you gain the experience and the confidence that you could open your own studio. Uh, there were a number of studios uh, that that were operating during the Civil War. Some were owned by women, some were owned by blacks. Uh, again, it was just that experience that you had to do. These were some of the biggest armies our country had ever put together up until that time. These uh, an incredible amount of soldiers that got put together. So a lot of them would follow the troops with their cameras. Uh, there were other sutlers that sold them other goods like tobacco and coffee, things like that. Well, the photographer would sell them the images then. Um, have any of you seen a photograph of yourself or a family member, your mom and dad, where their hair looks crazy or their clothes look real funny? Or it's a picture of your house and there's no trees in front of it, now there is, that kind of thing? Just about all of us. They. Uh, during the Civil War, these were people were the first ones to realize that that would happen. That that image stayed there and froze that moment in time. And they could always go back to it. Things changed. Time had changed things. Uh, they'd have a, an image of their town or village. The war would come through, damage part of it, or completely destroy it. Yet they had that image that was still there of what it looked like. So they were the first ones to realize that that had even happened. So they started to see the importance of it, of photography. Um, a lot of the northern photographers would help supply the southerners with some of the goods and, and 
things that were hard to get in the cell. Glass was hard to get in the cell. So then they would uh, some help supply them with glass and things like that. We had a couple chairs up front on either side. So that's something, uh, this idea of the wet plate was new, exciting, it was brand new, and, and it was easy. And that's kind of the transition we're seeing ourselves with film into digital. It's brand new, it's easy, it's wide open, it, it's the expression you can do with it is, is crazy. And that same excitement was there then that we see now with digital. I, uh, I bought a camera, it, it took me about well, a number of years to realize this. I bought a camera up in Wapaka from a studio, it was an old Crown Graphic the 1950s type uh, uh, press camera that had the big reflector and everything. It was a four by five inch negative, big negative, very clear pictures out of it. And I bought the thing at this auction and it had all these film packs in there that said developed before uh, February 1958. <laughs> I was born in 1957, so I'm thinking he bought that film, it's the same age as I was. At the time I was 30 when I bought it. Well, there was a pack of film, there were eight exposures, and there was several of them already exposed and never processed. So for whatever reason, they sat in his closet for 30 years until I came across them. Well, I processed them, and the first one, I had it in the fixer, and I couldn't wait that it needed to go another few minutes, and I had to hold it up to the light quick and put it back in the fixer, and as I held it up, it was a dinosaur. I put it back in the fixer going, no, nah, that can't be that old. <laughs> I was hoping for that shot of the grassy knoll, but that wasn't in there. And I did the next one, and it was a lady standing next to a brontosaurus waiting. And then, still not the grassy knoll. And then uh, the next few were beautiful shots of Mount Rushmore. There was little pits to them, but they were still really clear. Well, after that, I had used the camera, and that's the lens off of it that's right here. Uh, we went out to Cedar Rapids and went out to the Dakotas, and, and there were some aerial-type pictures from a high elevation. Well, we found that park where the brontosaurus is there in Rapid City. I see a lot of people nod their heads. We went up and recreated the same, <laughs> the same pictures. There's railings now, and I think a flag is up there that wasn't there before. But we still, a lot of the buildings, when we took the, the, the scenes, the shots down on the highway and stuff, uh, a lot of that's still seeable. And I sent a lot of those back to the gift shop. The ladies there were really nice. I was telling them the story, too. And I couldn't figure out, why would you just put a camera with all those nice film packs ready to go? Why would you just put that in your closet? Well, then digital come along. And I have a lot of medium format cameras that take film. Well, I went digital. And all of a sudden in my closet, I've got medium <laughs> format cameras with a bunch of film <laughs> that's ready to go. So I figured, okay, he bought a 35 millimeter camera. And he took that big one and said, oh, enough of that boat anchor. And he went with a, a smaller format, something easier, something more exciting. And so I saw that same transition. It took till digital for me to realize what that, why that camera had sat in that closet like that. So it was just something that was fun. Uh, any questions at all about photography? Okay, I'm going kind of fast. I'm used to doing this with uh, fifth graders on the Civil War days. We were up in Heritage Hill earlier in the week and we did 12 stations. So every 20 minutes a new group and you give the same presentation and it's hard to, you, I try and keep it the same every time so I don't mix it up. Uh, doing this type of thing for the Civil War, what I did when I started was just went and took pictures of the battles. And then I processed them and printed them overnight, had them on display for sale the next day. And that took off real good, but uh, that worked real good. The hobby <laughs> kept paying for itself. Well, after a while, they asked, can we get the, uh, some of the public involved in the Civil War? They come out, they see all of this history, they talk to it, they interact with it. Now they can kind of become part of it. So 
So then I bought the uniforms and the hoop skirts and the tent, and it just, as again, hobbies do, it grows bigger and bigger. Uh, the one thing, though, the Civil War reenacting, it was such a fun family event. You have friends that you only see once or twice a year, and, and it's just exciting to have that whole different circle of friends that you have that all have the same interest in history or whatever the hook was for them for reenacting. Some of them are, are military people that know that military discipline and they like to apply that to the older styles. Some are, uh, it's a trade thing, they're surgeons in real life and they like, again, the crudeness of, of where their particular, uh, 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 their, their, their whole line of work that they do now, where it came from, where it started from. So there's that hook. There's some people that find out their relative and, and find out their persona and the battles they were in. So then they try and do a first person and play that person, a particular person. So there's different hooks for reenacting. Uh, I always see it as, as in, in the schools, history is getting condensed to the point where it's names and dates. And it's fun to go out and actually see it and say, wow, that's how they did that? You gain a big respect for what those people endured, no matter what kind of reenacting it is or time period. You just gain a huge respect for what those people did endure. Uh, and with that, I'm pretty well caught up. Yeah, any questions? Can you talk a little bit about um, why the Civil War was, how that photography made people think differently about war? Oh, yeah, early on, of course, the Civil War wasn't supposed to last that long. It was going to be a very quick thing and over quick. Some of the first battles, they took picnic baskets and sat up on the ridge to watch it all happen. And when it started happening, they were surprised how brutal these people were getting killed. They were blown to bits. It wasn't very pretty or anything like that. A lot of the Civil War images, because they took so long, you don't see those action or battle shots like I was taking. It's more the aftermath of the battle or the cannon batteries and the, uh, all of the things before the battle. While they were getting some of these images and looking at them and, oh, no one should see this, and they would break them. They didn't even want to display those. A lot of, it's surprising any of the images in the first place survived being on glass. But a lot of them were lost just because of the brutality of it and what those images were showing. They said no one should see these, and they broke them. You hear stories of uh, greenhouses. Again, glass was hard to come by, so they would use the plates that already had images on them. They would use those to fill up their greenhouses. So you'd walk in, and here would be all these images, and, and the sun would slowly destroy all of those. So there was, you know, many images that just didn't come to pass. Again, it wasn't something that they thought some of them weren't uh, to be seen. Yes? Was there any, uh, just out of curiosity, did they use photography then for surveillance at all? I don't think... Like, you know, picturing troops or anything like that, or is that too, is it too primitive? I, I think it was a little primitive for that. I haven't really come I'm across any, any stories of that. There was a lot of that espionage going on, though. A lot of the women's, actually locally, isn't it, in Baraboo? Uh, uh, what's her name, Bell? Bell Boyd? She's in the Dells. In the Dells, is it? Okay. And, and there was a lot of that espionage going on and, and passing of where troops are and who's where. But I, I've never come across a story that, had, that meant to photograph. It just took too long. Mm -hmm. By the time those images were there, they had, they had moved <laughs> down, the battle was over already. Thank you. But that's a good question. Um, about like a, how Brady and that Yeah, a lot of, uh, when you think photography, Civil War is Matthew Brady. And Brady was a photographer, but he was even a better businessman and, and a better promoter. I tend to do more... I, I lean more towards Alexander Gardner when I tell people, that, oh, Matthew Brady, and I go, no, 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 Alexander Gardner. He was being an apprentice for um, Matthew Brady, so every image that he took went to the Brady studio. So it was called a Matthew Brady image because he was hired by Matthew Brady, so therefore everything he did was Matthew Brady's. Um, and he just promoted himself a lot better. 
So it, it, a lot of the Matthew Brady images, especially the battle ones, were probably in Alexander Gardner. Or there, was no, there was another number, there's about eight of them, but I can't think of their names right now, I'm too nervous. But uh, uh, he was a good businessman that way, Matthew Brady. Um, uh, in following these armies, these massive armies that were put up, the, uh, the officers in that would have a glass negative done and then, and then have an ambrotype and then uh, a contact print and would have an image that way where it would be a positive. Now the uh, tin types, which were one six plate, these are kind of bad examples, these are my bad ones here. These were more, and they were actually more of this size, a six plate. These were more durable and affordable for the infantrymen. So almost all of them could afford one of these and send it home. Again, it was on metal, their image was there, it would fit in their wallets, they could fit it in there. They were affordable as far as uh, sending them all home to their to their folks, their their uh, to their parents and things. These would take that emulsion right on. It was black iron. It wasn't actually tin. It was just hammered real thin. It was like a daguerreotype again with that camera obscure. The image was reversed. Everything was backwards. And then you just if you if you have a film negative, black and white, it's real thin. It's almost completely clear and you put black behind it, sometimes they'll look positive. And there'll be some images like that you'll see also in the antique stores. Uh, it was the same idea. They put that emulsion here and would just kind of underexpose it. So it was like a real thin negative. And to make a print from it, it wouldn't have been good if it were on, on uh, glass. You wouldn't have a real good print off of it. But with this black in the background, it becomes a positive. So that's how the tin types, but again, they were reversed. They were just like a daguerreotype. So it, it cut out one whole other process, and that's what made them cheaper that way. Uh, to make these, or even the CDVs, the cart of V's, which were more of a, and you see these in the antique stores as well. Uh, these were like a business card, cart de visite, or CDVs. <coughs> To mass produce these, they would have a lens board with like nine lenses on it. So that they would take one image and they would end up with nine copies of the same one. So it was easy to just contact print and make, you know, mass produce these. When you see them in the uh, antique stores, if you look on the back, some of the studio logos are interesting. There's toads riding tricycles and just very strange, ornate uh, uh, images. This one I, I stole from Ham Mago out of Princeton, and I found he stole it from Noyles, the guy before him that had a studio. Uh, he bought the studio from Noyles, and then Noyles had a bunch of those cabinet cards with that logo on, and then he put uh, 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 successor to Noyles, and then he put his name. So it was kind of funny. He stole the, the whole thing and then later took it. Now I stole it from him. But if there's a stamp on the back, a little green stamp, that meant it was after 1963. And that uh, that was a tax that was additional tax on the sales that would help go and fund the war. Uh, the Civil War brought out a lot of ideas, and that's one of them that never went away. But uh, something they discovered by putting multiple lenses is that if you had two lenses about the same distance apart as your eyes, and then you pinch that in with some lenses, again, this isn't quite Civil War period, <coughs> but if you pinch those images in, you would get that three-dimensional look. And that must have been like, like magic back then to, to see cathedrals in a different town or to see a different uh, town or village and to see it three-dimensional must have been just like magic, like magic forms. This one isn't Civil War period again, but it's, it does give you the idea how that works. Did you ever have a view master where you look through it? Yeah. And it looks like 3D, you can look through it. You might have to slide it forward and back. Go ahead, you can grab it. Go ahead, you can pass that around. Where do you run across uh, this one I found at an auction. It's, it's called an Eastman, improved Eastman number two. 
And what it is, it's got, again, not Civil War period. This one's only about 103 years old right now. It's got a lot of movements. The back moves forward, up and down. The lens, you can move up or down. There's where, again, uh, the bellows were very crude that could move forward or back. They were very crude uh, cameras. This one I got in an auction, I think I paid $30. Well, all of a sudden, camera collecting became big. Now you pay what they're worth. There's always somebody there that knows. Uh, when I bought it, it was, yeah, we don't think you can get plates for this anymore. And then I was the only one bidding on it. Well, it takes film. This one's a 4 by 5 So the negative size here is 4 inches by 5 inches. That smaller square that's in there is... Uh, uh, the roll bag that I shoot, that's a, a medium format size. Uh, have any of you seen the movie Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? Well, way in the beginning of that, I'm just going to set this by the window so we can look through it. In the beginning, they show, they show uh, a photographer taking a picture of the car as it goes by. And he sticks his head under the dark cloth and pulls up the flash pan. And it's a huge blooper. The only reason you would have a dark cloth is when you're moving that lens and trying to get that focus on the image. If you're sitting over there, it's a little darker inside here than outside, so you can kind of see it probably. Uh, when you're outside, the sun's reflecting off of this, and it's hard to see anything. So you would create your own little camera obscura and just darken it a little bit so that it, it brightens up that image a little bit better. Uh, once you've got your focus, you're done with the dark cloth. You don't need that anymore. So when he sticks his head under there to take the picture, it's, it's just a huge blooper. <laughs> when I, I didn't catch it the first time, but after I learned more, I'm like, that's way off. <laughs> well, it's something to look for. Uh, this camera, again, it's only about 103 years old. If you'd like to form a line here and just come up, you can look underneath the dark cloth, and you can have a look through the camera here. Was there a lot of competition between uh, sketchers and uh, camera people at that time? Because at that time, you'd see newspapers and stuff that have sketches. Yep. And, uh, I would think they'd work together. I haven't read anything that, that they would be against each other. Sketchers, they were always there because that's how you recorded it. Again, you had that artist there, and that reproduction was as good as the talent of that artist. Uh, and there were talented artists back then, because some of those sketches are incredible. Also, and some of the artwork from Also, for printing in the newspaper, they couldn't print. They hadn't developed the half-tone process yet, so they, uh, the, the, the sketches artists were, would make the woodcuts to print in the newspapers or magazines. Yeah. Tell me that again. They would actually cut the woodwork out from the sketches yeah, that were made? Yeah, make the wood woodcuts. Okay. Uh, uh, carve, carve the scene, line drawings to, to print them. Wow. They didn't have a process yet for, for the photos in town. Yeah, again, every time you learn something about how they did things, it's just huge respect for, for you know, what they endured and how they solved their problems. Anything else? Actually, I have more questions. Sure. Um, is it, why did they smile? Is it because you always know, hear they always had to like stand there for 10 minutes and not blink? Or well, or and that's that long exposure. Their, their chemistry wasn't sensitive to light enough. They'd have, if you look in the books, uh, to a soldier that's standing in a studio shot from head to toe, if you can see his feet, you look between his feet and you'll see the stand that he leaned back against. You can see the base of it every time. It's right there. Uh, they had a several little like V shapes. One was on their back, their hip, one by their shoulders, and then a really nasty, nasty one right up here by the back of your neck. And that, they were very uncomfortable and that's, they'd have to lean against that and hold still for that 30 seconds. I did a tin type of a soldier and I had him lean forward on his musket like a tripod, figuring it was, I was doing 30 second exposures, actually a pretty, pretty quick one. And as we did the exposure, it was good up to his knees and the lock plate looked awesome. And then up to about his waist, it started to, started to fade. 
And then by the time I got up to his face, it was unacceptable. It was just kind of blurry. And all it was, you can blink, that's okay. It's, you know, blink is quick enough, but he was breathing. And again, it was that, that little bit of up and down and a little bit of side to side, but it was more up and down. I'm like, what were you doing? And then, again, and then you could see he was breathing and it was just, just that little bit. So those darn things must have been nasty to, to have to lean against them. But it was things must have been nasty to, to have to lean against them. But it was that long exposure. It's not Wrigley's gum idea where no one smiled until their gum was invented. And then everybody started smiling. That was their answer to that. Anything else? I actually have. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was a lot of fun getting out and reunited. I'm interested in the lifestyle of the Did they stay with the same regiment? Did they travel with the Army? Because there's pictures of Gettysburg, so they were at Gettysburg. Yep. And so they were in the same danger as everybody. Did they, they would just move, move around with them. Battles, or did they stay with their same? Well, they'd have to go back for supplies occasionally. A lot of them work by themselves or their apprentice. Mm -hmm. So they'd have to go back and get more chemistry and then head back out again. Yeah. Some just follow the armies and then they follow a different army. Okay, we're done with that one. And, they, and they'd work with another group and, and uh, just keep moving about. Yeah. I was surprised on how many studios there were. At the time, I always thought it was those eight Matthew Brady, and there's a lot, of, you know, just a handful. But there, there was, there was a lot more. Uh, some of the uh, towards the middle of the war, they'd have to pay a tax to own a, a set studio in a town. So they would pay a tax to the north or the south, depending where they were. So if you were on a border state, and all of a sudden that line changed. You got hooked for both taxes. You have to pay to the north and to the south, so you kind of got stuck in the middle. But a lot of people got stuck in the middle of that conflict. So. All right. If anybody wants to look underneath here and look through a 200-year-old camera, that's available. And then I think Glenn's gonna head outside after this, and he has to set about there, and he's going to be available to take your portraits of your family or yourself. And I think you can get a print in the mail later. Um, he has prices of that listed outside of this. Board. Um, of course, I have to ask for donations. This event is free because of a grant from the Great Circle Foundation in New York City. But we do have a donation box by the door, and the little blurb I want to tell you is we usually make about $300 a year on a donation box. If every visitor gave one quarter, we'd make $1,000. So it's just think about that as you go out the door. Um, thank you for coming, and please come back. We have a whole year full of Civil War events. Thank you. Thank you.